Hello and welcome to Friday's edition of COVID-19. Compared to global demand for COVID-19 vaccines, supply remains limited amid production challenges. Now, this is what we address in this edition after a look at the latest pandemic numbers across the world with our Kwon Soa. So let's begin here in Korea, where COVID-19 numbers are holding stubbornly steady in the mid-400s. Right, Sunny, not a big change in the daily COVID-19 figures here in Korea with 463 infections reported this Friday and that includes 441 domestic transmissions and 22 cases from abroad. Now, our daily tally has mainly been fluctuating between the 400s and 300s for over two months now and as you can see, this week not being an exception. And with that, Korea has a total of 97,750 57 new inf uh, total infections, that is, and a total of 1,690 fatalities. If we take a look at our map now, we have a similar number in the capital, Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province, and also double digits in Incheon, Jeollabuk-do province, also down there in Gyeongsangnam-do province, with uh, additional cluster in infections in that part of the country as well. I see. Meanwhile, so how are things progressing on the vaccine front here and abroad? Well, Sunny, first here in Korea, almost 660,000 uh, vaccinations have been now completed and with either AstraZeneca or Pfizer vaccines. So with that, 82.5% of the government's first quarter inoculation plan has been completed. And this coming weekend, the second round of Pfizer shots will start to get administered. Uh, meanwhile, adverse reactions were so far seen in roughly 1.4 percent of those vaccinated and some 30 percent were said to have reported some discomfort but health officials are telling the public not to panic if your symptoms ease after taking fever medication or painkillers take a rest rather than going to the hospital we also advise you not to visit the emergency room, either on the day of your vaccination or the day after, to seek treatment for pain around the injection spot, muscle aches or fever. And with more vaccinations coming up next week, including for people aged 65 and above, further information on the vaccination program can also be checked online and also through a call center. Now, AstraZeneca vaccinations, meanwhile, for seniors, uh, the vaccination has been resumed, will be resumed in some European countries after a suspension recently, including in France, Italy, Germany and Spain. We will have further on that in our later segments. And that is good news for the countries that I just mentioned because there are resurgences in European, European countries due to variants with France now officially announcing a third wave of the virus as well as a new lockdown around the metropolitan region. Let's uh, check the numbers now abroad and let's start with France which is close to 4.2 million infections and reported almost 35,000 new infections in just a day. And then here in Germany at around around 2.6 million infections, almost 18,000 cases were reported here in a day and over 70% of those were said to be variant infections. And last but not least, uh, the total number of cases around the world stands at 122.3 million with over half a million of new cases reported in just a day. And those are the updates I have for now. No afternoon briefings on Fridays, so I will see you back on Monday. Sunny. All right, so I thank you for now. Right, now for more details on the EU drug regulator's stance with regard to concerns of AstraZeneca's vaccine in the region, I have Kim sung yeon here in the studio with me. Welcome, sung yeon Good afternoon. Right, sung yeon let's begin with a vote of confidence in AstraZeneca's vaccine by the European Medicines Agency. Right, uh, we are talking about Europe's drug regulator's announcement uh, Thursday local time uh, that there is no evidence of any links between AstraZeneca vaccines and the reports of post-inoculation blood clots. Now, hence, uh, countries in Europe are set to resume their rollout of AstraZeneca vaccines following the EMA's conclusion that they are safe and effective. Now, the European Medicines Agency had launched a special probe to investigate the unusual blood clot disorders reported in several people who received the AstraZeneca vaccine. And in its latest announcement, the EMA noted the vaccine may be associated with blood clots in some very rare cases, but emphasized its benefits outweighed the risk of possible side effects. 
This is a safe and effective vaccine. Its benefits in protecting people from COVID-19 with the associated risks of death and hospitalization outweigh the possible risks. Concluding what it called its preliminary review, the EMA said that although no causal links were found, there is still a remote possibility that warrants further analysis. Earlier on in the week, uh, Cook had also stressed the importance of building trust in the safety of the vaccines. More than a dozen European countries, including Germany, France and Italy, have suspended the use of AstraZeneca's vaccine pending the outcome of the EMA's review, since it found the jab was not associated with a higher risk of climate. Uh, those countries said that, that they would resume using the jab. Right. Now, Song Yun, these concerns in Europe did not affect the rollout of AstraZeneca vaccines here in Korea, right? Right. As you said, Korea is one country that did not uh, suspend the rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccines. And earlier on, in fact, the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency said that the country will continue to hand out AstraZeneca's vaccines as planned, adding that it would closely monitor the EMA's assessment. Now, uh, Korea has reported uh, two suspected cases of blood clots among those who received AstraZeneca vaccines. One of the patients died with authority saying that death was likely caused by underlying health conditions. The other patient, a man in his 20s, is currently in hospital but in stable condition. Now this morning, Prime Minister Chung tae yoon said there is no reason to stop the rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccines here in the country, adding that the KDCA must take a confident approach to ease any kind of public concerns. Right, meanwhile, elsewhere, in a rather shocking turn of events, I understand the EU has threatened to ban the export of AstraZeneca vaccines, claiming it has not been receiving its fair share. Right, uh, uh, Sunny, on Wednesday, the EU did say that it is prepared to take those kinds of extraordinary measures uh, to basically halt the export of COVID-19 vaccines to Britain and secure doses for its own citizens unless the UK starts shipping shots to the bloc. The European Commission president said the bloc wants to see reciprocity and proportionality in exports. Now, Ursula von der Leyen said Europe could trigger an emergency clause in the EU treaty, which would allow the bloc to seize factories, override intellectual property rights, and impose export bans. And she said, quote, this is about making sure that Europe gets its fair share, unquote. Let's take a listen to what else she had to say. It is hard to explain to our citizen why vaccines produced in the European Union um, are going to other countries that are also producing vaccines, but hardly nothing is coming back to the European Union. She also emphasized that Europe was facing the crisis of the century and that they have to make sure Europeans are vaccinated as soon as possible as human lives, civil liberties and the economy are dependent on the speed of vaccination moving forward. She hinted that all options are on the table to make that happen. If the situation does not change, we will have to reflect on how to make exports to vaccine producing countries dependent on their level of openness. Meanwhile, Ursula von der Leyen's threat quickly produced a strong response from the UK with Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab accusing the EU of engaging in brinkmanship of the type exhibited by less democratic countries. Take a listen. Frankly, uh, I'm surprised we're having this conversation. It is normally what the UK and the EU team up with to object when other countries uh, with less democratic regimes than our own uh, engage in that kind of brinkmanship. The Foreign Secretary said he had already been in touch with the EU's foreign policy chief and its vice president and that they weren't aware of any plans to restrict supply to the UK. Rab said von der Leyen's remarks take some explaining, saying that it would be wrong for the EU to be interfering with lawfully contracted supply. I see. All right, Song Yun, as always, thank you very much for that coverage. The pleasure is mine. Right. Also on the international front, Asians in America are not just fighting the pandemic. They're also fighting hate crimes. Now, for more, more on this reality, I have James Ahn, the head of the, American, of the Korean American Federation of Los Angeles, live on the line. Welcome, Mr. Ahn. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Right. Now, before we touch upon this sad and shocking reality, of course, Mr. Ahn, perhaps we could start with a few words on the COVID-19 situation in L.A., Sure. Um, well, in, in the United States generally, according to the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, over 21% of the U.S. population have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. 
and we are on track to uh, here in California specifically, businesses are slowly reopening now, which is very important because, as you all know, the largest diaspora of Korean Americans live here in Los Angeles, and they have been disproportionately, disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Um, also, many of the public schools are starting to, starting in-person learning as soon as April or May, so that's good news. Uh, the U.S. is expected to achieve herd um, immunity by November of this year. I see. Now, Ms. An, as I mentioned earlier, there has been an alarming surge in verbal and physical violence against Asian Americans in the U.S. How severe is this situation? Yes, uh, since the start of the pandemic, there has been an alarming increase in anti-Asian uh, hate incidents. For example, here in Los Angeles, between the year 2019 and 2020, there was, an 100, there was a 114% increase in reported hate crimes against Asian Americans. Uh, during the pandemic, close to 3,800 3, hate incidents have been reported throughout the country. Uh, this has caused many Korean and Asian Americans feeling scared to even go outside their homes. So simply speaking, Ms. Dan, hostility against Asians has soared in light of this pandemic then? Correct. Now, earlier this week, Ms. Dan, eight people, including four Korean Americans, were shot and killed at uh, Atlanta area spas. Can you tell us a bit about this tragedy? Uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're still waiting for the full results of the investigation. However, if you look at the facts of the case, the perpetrator targeted an Asian owned business and entered with the intent to kill Asians. Uh, there are eyewitness accounts that allege that the perpetrator even shouted, kill all Asians. Uh, many of the authorities investigating this case are using words like a sex addict and that he had mental health issues. However, the Korean American Federation of Los Angeles and many other Asian American organizations are demanding to call for it for what it is an Asian hate crime. Um, you know, there's a trend in this country where authorities tend to minimize and use the Asian American community as a scapegoat for its problems. For example, during the 1992 Los Angeles riots, which was, you know, almost 30 years ago, the Korean American community was portrayed as a villain where the main issue was racial injustice and over policing. Ms. Chan, I believe the U.S. President Joe Biden has also denounced this brutality, this recent brutality in Atlanta. Yes, so I actually watched President Biden's uh, address to the nation, and it was very uh, empowering for me personally. Uh, President Biden has ordered flags. Uh, President Biden has since ordered flags at the White House and federal grounds to be flown at half staff to honor the victims of the Atlanta shooting. The vi President and Vice President Kamala Harris will be traveling to Georgia on Friday to meet personally with leaders of the Asian American community. Now, during the last presidential election, the Asian American community overwhelmingly supported candidate Joe Biden, and we believe that he will allocate resources to, you know, get the truth. Now, Korean American Federation of Los Angeles has activated the nationwide network of the Korean American Federations to engage with the White House in calling for the creation of a special task force dedicated to combating anti-Asian hate crimes. And we also ask for the Korean American community to be invited to this task force as a key community advisor. I see. Ms. Dan, I understand that uh, Korean Americans there are also holding rallies uh, to denounce this uh, tragedy. Yes, uh, as the largest Korean American umbrella organization in Southern California, we are organizing a stop AAPI hate car caravan uh, tomorrow here in Koreatown, Los Angeles, to raise the awareness of this issue and pay tribute to the victims of the Atlanta massacre. Uh, we are also in the process of distributing informational brochures which contain vital information about what to do in case you're a victim of a hate incident and it also includes phone numbers that the public can call to seek assistance we're also handing out accompanying whistles which some of our seniors can use to deter any potential hate incident also next week we are organizing a multiracial press conference which will consist of leaders from the Latino and African-American community. And the event will promote unity, solidarity, while continuing to raise awareness around this issue. In addition to the press conference, we plan to give out groceries to the low-income seniors in our community. And lastly, we are advocating for the passage of multiple state and federal level legislations uh, which hope will streamline reporting of the anti-Asian hate and provide resources to those that are victims. I see. All right, Ms. Dan, thank you very much for making the time to shed light on this particular issue for us. Thank you very much.
right to our viewers here. We do also apologize for the slight disruptions in our connection with Mr. An over in LA. Meanwhile, back here in Korea, Seoul city officials are turning to the power of spring to address the psychological toll of social distancing measures amid the pandemic. For more on this endeavor, our Chun Song Cho is out on location. Hello, Song Cho. Good afternoon, Sunny. Right, Song Cho, do give us the details then. I'm in front of the National Police Center in southern Seoul for something quite different today. Well, the reason why I came here is these beautiful flowers behind me. Well, it's officially spring now. Uh, I feel like the weather is warm enough. Uh, the temperature here where I am is hovering around 20 degrees Celsius, so I think it's warm enough to take off my jacket even. Um, so usually around this time of the year, people travel around the country whenever they can to enjoy the country's beautiful spring foliage. But this year, the majority of spring flower festivals have been either canceled or postponed, reduced in size or shortened even. Uh, so I thought it'd be perfect to bring you guys here to show you these incredible spring, spring colors. So um, actually earlier this month, the Seoul city government started adding more flowers and more colors to the city's sidewalks by turning uh, these small patches of land into flower gardens, especially in areas uh, around hospitals, test centers, and triage centers, because these are the places where people really need that extra help to uh, lift up their spirits and also so that they can uh, get through this devastating pandemic. So as you can see, they're adding these strips of potted flowers along the waiting lines or even uh, near the entrances and exits of hospitals and clinics for COVID-19 patients. Uh, where I am here, uh, that's the National Police Hospital and uh, that's the emergency. And there's also a test center right there. This is the exit and entrance that people uh, frequently use. So every time people pass by after getting tests or whatever and treatment, um, they can look at these flowers and hopefully they'll really lighten up their day. So there are about 120 locations in Seoul City alone that are going to be uh, really filled with tens of thousands of flowers like uh, daffodils and daisies. So. Uh, Flowers are really known for their positive energy, right? Uh, they can really help people feel relaxed. But I feel like um, there are less and less reasons for people to celebrate and give flowers to one another because we are all of these uh, events and ceremonies are getting canceled or postponed. Even uh, schools graduation ceremonies have moved online this year. So the government's um, effort and decision to uh, plant more flowers across the city, I think, is definitely welcomed by many people in the city because it will not only add a vibrant colors and joy to our everyday lives, but also it will help boost the consumption of the struggling flower market. So enough with that. Uh, let's talk to an official from the Green Seoul Bureau. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Thank you for joining our show. Thank you for your time. So these uh, flowers are just incredible. They are really pleasing to the eye. Uh, what's been the reaction from the passersby so far? People are comfort and happy with watching the flowers. We know it's a tough time around the world and they are stressed as the social distancing. So we hope they are getting energized and overcome COVID-19 when looking at these flowers. Uh, I agree with you on that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, so weather is definitely turning for the better. So it's time to dust up your T-shirts, shorts, and sunnies. Uh, and really, don't let the virus get you down uh, because you can just come out here and enjoy the flowers out in the open. You can do so in a safe manner while avoiding crowded places and keeping social distance from others. This has been Chun Song Cho reporting live and back to you, Sunny, in the studio. All right, Song Cho, thank you for that visual treat. This country will have enough vaccine supply, I'll say it again, for every adult in America by the end of May. By the end of May. That's progress.
this not only leaves the world's most vulnerable people at risk, it's also short-sighted and self-defeating. Vaccine nationalism will only prolong the pandemic. The rich countries and pharmaceutical companies are blocking this, and this is absolutely uh, uh, inhumane at this time that we're putting profits uh, above humanity. A fresh debate has been ignited amid the development of COVID-19 vaccines and their limited supplies. Now, are these vaccines private patents or are they a global public good? That is what we seek to answer and other questions, of course. For that, I have Professor Kim moon -Gyu from Yonsei University. Welcome back, Professor Kim. Thank you. And I also have Dr. Alice Hyung-Yong Tan from Ms. Medi Women's Hospital. Good to see you again, Dr. Tan. Good afternoon. Meanwhile, joining this session virtually is Dr. Deborah Gleeson at La Trobe University in Australia. Pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Gleeson. Good afternoon. Right then, Dr. Uh, Professor Kim. The plan is to offer the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine here in Korea to 12 million people by the end of June. Is this a feasible plan when considering our current supplies? Well, we, we should do the best, and I do believe that our Korean government is doing their best to uh, secure the uh, vaccine supply. And uh, uh, But we, if we compare to other foreign countries, I think uh, uh, Korean government should secure more vaccine because some unexpected situation might happen uh, during the course of the uh, schedule. Such problem as uh, uh, the raw materials are getting in shortage right now, so uh, we should secure enough vaccines. And, you know, uh, some tr problems might happen during the uh, production line and uh, also during the uh, delivery process. And uh, let's say if we have some un unexpected side effects of uh, one kind of vaccine, then we should, we might have to shift to another kind. So. I think that's the reason many countries are trying to preserve more as they can. And uh, if we face another new strain of uh, mutant, which is resistant to uh, the vaccines already we have, that might be a minor issue to consider more. So at least Korea has its own production uh, companies and uh, also we are uh, developing new kinds of vaccines. So that is an advantage for Korea. Right. Meanwhile, Dr. Tan, the interval between the first and second shots of the AstraZeneca vaccine is between 8 and 12 weeks. So authorities here are planning to offer the supplies reserved for the second shots, uh, the second round of vaccinations, that is, as first doses to more people. What are your thoughts on this? I think that's a reasonable policy, and I base this uh, based on what we know uh, about the AstraZeneca vaccine. First of all, um, even uh, in the phase three studies, with just one shot of the AstraZeneca vaccine that gave us a vaccine uh, efficacy of 70% at three weeks. So that's actually quite high in terms of vaccine efficacy. The Scotland study also showed that after one dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, it was able to decrease hospitalizations by 94%. Um, and this was at four to five weeks. Now, in terms of the timing, um, we know that both the vaccine efficacy and also the spike binding um, antibody response, they both increase as we increase the interval of uh, the, the dose schedule, so between the first and second uh, doses. And so if we extend the second dose to 12 weeks or beyond, both the immunological response and um, the projected vaccine efficacy will go up. Vaccine efficacy, when we give the second dose at 12 weeks, goes up to 80%. So based on that, and then based on the supplies of the vaccine, so we received 1.56 million doses uh, in February of AstraZeneca. We are projected to receive another 2.1 million doses in April. So when I do the math, it, it figures out to, um, we'll be able to deliver an additional 1.32 million doses on top of having enough to give the second dose 
to all the all the people who started the initiation, the initial vaccine uh, in February. So I think this policy of of you know trying to vaccinate as many people as possible with the initial dose uh, is is a sound policy based on um, science. Right. Now, Dr. Gleason, I believe Australia launched its vaccination campaign around the same time as Korea, meaning it's been about three weeks now. How are things progressing there in Australia with regard to vaccinations? Well, the first stage of Australia's vaccination program involved vaccinating people who come into contact with potentially infected travellers, so particularly hotel quarantine workers, border workers and frontline healthcare workers, and also people in residential aged care and disability services and the staff in those services. But from next week, the eligibility for vaccination in Australia will extend to people aged over 70, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders over 55, and adults with medical conditions that put them at higher risk. And this stage is being rolled out through general practitioners, as well as 100 special vaccine clinics that are being set up by the federal government. After that stage, um, all adults over the age of 50 will be offered the vaccine, and then eventually the rest of the adult population. But as of the 14th of March, um, only 164,000 doses had been administered, and that puts Australia quite far behind its target of administering 4 million doses by the end of March. The government initially promised that all Australian adults, which is about 20 million people, would be vaccinated by the end of October this year, but it's becoming clearer that it's going to take longer than this, although the government still aims to deliver the first vaccine dose for all adults by then. To meet the target, we'd actually need to be vaccinating about 200,000 people a day. And of course, the vaccine rollout is a really massive undertaking and there have been some teething problems, issues around supply, logistics and distribution, and also booking systems not being able to cope with demand. Right, and staying with that, Dr Gleeson, what can you tell us about Australia's COVID-19 vaccine procurement? So the government has contracts for vaccines from Pfizer, um, 10 million doses, from AstraZeneca, 53.8 million doses, and Novavax, 51 million doses, although the Novavax vaccine is not approved yet for use in Australia. And um, Australia also participates in COVAX and should have access to 25 million doses through COVAX as well. 50 million of the AstraZeneca doses will be produced by a company called CSL located in Melbourne in Australia um, and they're aiming to produce about 1 million doses per week from late March. But the other 3.8 million AstraZeneca doses were to come from overseas and to fill the gap before um, AstraZeneca was able to manufacture on that scale. But a shipment of 250,000 vaccine doses from Italy to Australia was blocked in early March. Australia has received other shipments of um, the vaccines and by around the 10th of March, there were about 1.3 million doses of Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines in Australia. So while the export restrictions from the EU do pose issues for us and may slightly delay the rollout, the imminent rollout of locally produced vaccines will soon make up for any shortfall as the program progresses. Right. Meanwhile, Professor Kim, vaccine production problems are challenging efforts aimed at ensuring proper distribution and supply, of course. How severe is the situation? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, if we look at the uh, Canadian and uh, United States, they are preparing more than five to six times of their own population. And uh, uh, most of the Euro European countries prepare more than three to four times of their population size. So uh, uh, they are much prepared for their population size. And there are another issue about trading. As the, Deborah mentioned, <coughs> uh, USA blocked exporting uh, AstraZeneca vaccine to Europe. And uh, Europe might also block Pfizer uh, vaccine exporting to USA. And I think uh, the uh, uh, politicians are in charge of what to decide. And I think there are considering considering that the vaccine is kind of a security issue. But uh, we have to remember that there are also ethnic issue because developing countries who don't manufacture, have a manufacturing facility, 
they are becoming more difficult to secure their own uh, vaccines. So uh, I think we should have some talk and uh, make way for the developing countries to uh, prepare. Right, and this is something that the COVAX facility seeks to do, Dr. Tan. It seeks to ensure equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. How is this initiative progressing? Right, so the Co COVAX is the largest vaccine rollout in the history of the world. Uh, and since the first shipments were delivered February 24th to Ghana, uh, as of March 18th, more than 30 million doses have been delivered to 52 economies worldwide. This represents uh, about 13 percent of the uh, goal of the first round of allocation of vaccines. The goal was to deliver 237 million doses of AstraZeneca and 1.2 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine. So it is proceeding, I think, um, uh, smoothly, relatively smoothly. Um, there will be you know, uh, challenges, uh, as mentioned, along the way. The ultimate goal for 2021 is to deliver 2 billion doses of vaccine around the world um, by the end of this year. Uh, in terms of, you know, what needs to be done um, to ensure a smooth rollout, I think two things we need to make sure do not run out. One is funding, obviously. Uh, and then secondly, the most important is political will to make this happen. Uh, the leaders, but also the citizens of every country, we need to support this global multilateral solution to the pandemic. Uh, and without this support, um, we're, we're really doomed to failure uh, and sort of a, an unnecessary extension of the pandemic. Uh, and so things are progressing. Um, I think, well, I, I was, um, interested to learn actually that South Korea was the second country in the world to receive vaccines through COVAX uh, uh, and with, through, our, um, deliver, through the delivery of the Pfizer vaccine. And so it is, you know, one by one, the countries around the world are receiving their supply with that initial goal of vaccinating the most vulnerable 20% of the population. Right, and along with that initiative by the COVAX facility, Professor Kim, a number of developing countries, including uh, India and South Africa, have been calling for a temporary waiver of intellectual property rights for COVID-19 related medical products, including vaccines, of, cl of course. What are the implications of this waiver? Every product uh, goes through a process of manufacturing and usually there is a patency in each step, especially in biomedical products. and. Uh, this is regarded as a property of the uh, company and the uh, companies can raise the price if their own intellectual property have a monopoly uh, over their products. And I think they also have to prepare for a possible future lawsuits if it's a, a vaccine or some kind of medicine. So uh, they want to raise the price. Unfortunately, this claim may result in a less access to uh, life-saving uh, treatments and medications. And that's the situation that uh, most of the uh, developing countries are facing. If the companies can think globally, and I think there is a place that uh, patent right owners can yield and uh, the global needs can meet together. Uh, it will be better for global organizations, you know, they can make a friendly environment for the companies. And uh, I don't know what, whatever it will be, but uh, I think we can keep some kind of privilege for the companies who want to yield or some incentive, whatever it is. So we can prepare for the next global project. And uh, maybe uh, the uh, companies might get some advantage domestically also. Right, and staying with that, Dr. Gleason, a related meeting on a possible waiver was held at the World Trade Organization last week. Now, what appear to be the issues of contention, Dr. Gleason, here? So the waiver of intellectual property rights is now co-sponsored by 57 low and middle income countries and supported by another 61 countries. So altogether, this is um, more than two thirds of the members of the World Trade Organization. But it's being fiercely opposed by several wealthy countries, including the US, the EU, 
the UK, Japan and Switzerland. So many of those countries have large research-based um, pharmaceutical industries that would be lobbying heavily against this type of um, waiver for intellectual property rights. But the low and middle income countries say that they need the waiver to be able to scale up vaccine production quickly enough. Countries that oppose the waiver argue that intellectual property rights are necessary to stimulate innovation. But that ignores the fact that development of COVID-19 products has been underpinned by billions of dollars in public funding. Some countries, including Australia, have actually made a counter proposal to the World Trade Organization, arguing that voluntary license agreements between vaccine developers and manufacturers and existing mechanisms to bypass patents will be enough to solve the supply problems. But this definitely wouldn't go far enough. Countries can already negotiate these voluntary licenses and those types of approaches haven't solved the problem. And the existing mechanisms to bypass patents are really time consuming and they don't apply to the other types of knowledge and information that are really important for making vaccines. Right, and staying with that, Dr. Dunn, some claim such a temporary waiver of intellectual property rights will do little to address vaccine shortages as only a few countries have manufacturing capacity. This is something that Professor Kim had touched upon earlier. What are your thoughts on this? Right, so making a vaccine is a highly sophisticated process. It's not like you know, baking a cake, you can't just give the recipe to anyone who has an oven and, you know, tell them go and, and you know, make the product. Uh, it requires, you know, very specialized raw materials, specialized factories and processes. The quality control measures are very strict. They have to be adhered to, you know, every step of the way. Uh, and it takes a lot of um, uh, funding also to make this a reality. Currently, our worldwide capacity to uh, make COVID-19 vaccines uh, stands at, I think, somewhere between 3.5 and 5.5 billion doses a year. Of course, we need 14 billion doses uh, to get to the kind of immunity that we need globally. So in order to overcome uh, the hurdles, I think what we need to do is improve the efficiency of current capacity. Uh, also, perhaps repurposing current capacity. So there might be factories that can be repurposed to make more vaccine. And then ultimately we will need to add more capacity in order to reach our goal. Now, people may feel that um, uh, there's some hesitancy to, to do this because there's a risk of then having um, too much uh, resources put into making a vaccine when and then when the pandemic is over then the demand will go down and that gives a uh, supply and demand imbalance but I think the solution to that is to really think uh, about the global health care needs of vaccinations and the idea of producing vaccines as a global public good going forward beyond COVID-19. So sort of having a, an extended COVAX philosophy towards diseases that need vaccines. That will make, um, I think, the, uh, you know, the impetus, the motivation for going forward to get the, um, the process rolling in terms of getting all of the logistics in place for vaccine production. I think that will help motivate people to make the push in that direction. Meanwhile, Professor Kim, what are some ways to bridge the gap over differences with regard to the WAVE initiative? Do we have any examples from the past that we can look to? We have a good example uh, in HIV drugs. And uh, after there are billions of people suffering from AIDS. And uh, over the two decades, the price of HIV drug uh, dropped from 10,000 US dollars to uh, $100 per person in many sub-Saharan uh, countries in 2015. This became possible because uh, sustained advocacy to increase the availability of quality assured genetic drugs of uh, HIV. Uh, so I think uh, uh, if we can address intellectual property rights issues, I think it is also possible for COVID-19 vaccines and also special drugs for COVID-19. And uh, 
we should review how we achieved a successful story from HIV drugs and uh, uh, well this is vaccine is an injection and uh, HIV drugs are usually uh, medications you can uh, take by mouth so uh, as Dan, uh, Professor Dan mentioned that there, the quality control is more difficult for uh, injections but still I think there is a way we can uh, learn from uh, the uh, HIV drug uh, case. Right. And speaking about learning from such cases, Dr. Gleason, are there any other ways of boosting vaccine supplies aside from waiving intellectual property rights, do you think? I think that alongside waiving intellectual property rights, we also need to have mechanisms to enable the sharing of intellectual property. The, the most important mechanism that we have for sharing intellectual property rights is the COVID-19 technology access pool, which has been established by the World Health Organization. And that's currently languishing for lack of support from um, many countries. It's, it's been endorsed by 40 countries, um, but it's so far been unused. So it'll be really important for um, countries that want to see intellectual property shared to actually mandate that the companies um, that they're funding contribute their intellectual property to that mechanism. As um, other panellists have mentioned, it's also really important to build the manufacturing capacity in low and middle income countries, not just for the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in preparation for future pandemics. And we also need to be exploring alternative ways to fund research and development that doesn't depend on monopoly rights that then exclude large parts of the world's population. There's many issues that need to be attended to. Right. Dr. Tan, what efforts should be made by the international community to ensure that COVID-19 vaccines become a global good then? I think the number one priority is really to raise awareness about the importance of the global community's uh, full participation in um, the effort to try to vaccinate uh, everyone on the planet against COVID-19. Um, in 2015, uh, all 193 member states of the United Nations, they agreed on a set of sustainable development goals. And right at the top, um, so it was number three of the 17 goals was to provide uh, or to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being uh, to everyone at all ages. Um, and, and in 2019, right before the pandemic broke out, these goals were reviewed and um, support for these goals was, uh, was uh, confirmed once again. So now we have the pandemic and um, it's really thrust the importance of making these goals a reality for the world right now. We can't wait until 2013 2030, that was the time frame for when to achieve these goals. So I think um, the concept of enlightened self-interest, in other words, you know, what was the biggest mistake of this pandemic? I think in the beginning, uh, people thought the new pneumonia going on in Wuhan was not my problem. I think that was the biggest mistake. And I think it would be delusional for people to think right now that if Korea achieves herd immunity, then it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of the world, that the pandemic will be over for, for me and my country and we can go to life as usual. That's not the way that it's going to work. We need to have people aware of the need of global vaccine access, equitable access in order for everyone to return to a more normal, a healthier, safer, fairer life uh, after COVID-19 is over. And so I would like, you know, as we're doing right now is to raise awareness, make people know that this is important. Once people are aware, then they will demand it. You know, they will make sure that their political leaders also demand it. And once the political will is there, then we get the public and private cooperation to really make it happen. Right. Dr. Dan, thank you for those words of wisdom. And Professor Kim, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so and Dr. Much. Gleason over in Australia, thank you very much for making this time to join us live at this hour. Thank you very much. Right now, cluster infections continue within daily settings, including venues of social activity. So do seek to strictly abide by prevention measures when outdoors and away from home. Have a safe weekend.